in that regard, but I assure you it's a challenging matter to begin with. Uh, in the particular case that's before you this evening, uh, it's a bit, a bit different in that the former property owner, Mr. Pio, uh, and other interested parties have been quite uh, persistent in pushing this issue, whereas all the other properties that fall on that list, uh, folks aren't that quite that anxious for one reason or another. And so I really thought in respect to uh, their interest in the property, um, it was worthy of council's attention. Uh, so I apologize, it's a bit out of order. The policy prescribes a more comprehensive process, um, and we can go through that if you wish, but I want to make sure that uh, the folks here this evening had the opportunity to address the council and provide some context as to their particular plight. And then maybe at later this evening, at our later time, we can talk about the larger issue of how to deal with this challenging um, set of circumstances. And I assure you, each one of these properties has a unique history all to itself, and this one is no different. Uh, so I'm not sure, Rick, would you like to begin? Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Rick Cheney. I'm an attorney with Drummond Woodson in Portland, and I represent the uh, Catholic Foundation of Maine. Um, with me tonight is Elizabeth Badger, who is the executive director of the uh, foundation, and as Tom said, uh, Joseph Pio, who is a former owner of this property, which is out on the county road. Uh, I'm going to let Joe fill in some of the details here, but I want to give you the quick sort of thumbnail overview. Back in 2010, then Bishop Malone approached Joe and asked him if he was willing to make a substantial uh, donation to the church, to the foundation. Um, Joe said he was willing to do it uh, and proposed to convey this piece of property out on County Road so that the foundation could then turn around and, and sell the property, have the cash to use for its, for its various um, purposes. Um, Joe signed, uh, and I think all this stuff is in the town's records, yes. Joe signed a letter of intent in 2010, um, not necessarily a legal document per se, but a representation of his willingness to convey this property to the foundation. Um, for a whole lot of reasons, for everybody's fault, nobody's fault, the actual conveyance of the property never took place. Joe had some health issues, which he'll explain later. Um, there was a turnover at the foundation. Elizabeth was not there then. A gentleman named Chris Riley was the, the ED, and he left. So the bottom line is the conveyance never occurred. The town continued to tax the property to Joe. Liens were filed. Um, Joe assumed in part that it's not unusual when property gets sold during a tax year, that the bills still go to the prior owner. And they, pass them on to the new owner. Um, not making excuses, but it happens. Taxes didn't get paid, the liens matured, and under Maine law, the town now legally owns the property, assuming the town properly you know, followed the steps in the tax lien uh, foreclosure process. And we're not here tonight to discuss that, nor are we here tonight, by the way, to take issue with the town's policy, although I will say it's kind of draconian. But in any event, um, so here we are. Town owns the property. Joe very much wants to make the donation, donation to the to the uh, foundation. The foundation intends to immediately put the property on the market. And I know Tom had mentioned some concern. Some of you may have concerned that if the property does get conveyed back to Joe, um, and he conveys it to the foundation, that it would become tax exempt. The foundation has no intention to file for tax exempt status. In fact, I don't think they would qualify because they wouldn't be holding this property for their exempt purposes. They're going to turn around and sell it. Um, Joe, of course, is willing, I let him say this himself, but he's willing to pay all of the back taxes and any other costs and expenses that the town has incurred in return for the town's willingness to reconvey the property to him so he can make the donation that he intended to make in 2010. So that's the big picture. Joe, I, maybe you can fill in some of the detail on what happened and why it happened. Sure. I mean, I own and operate a business in Scarborough on Payne Road that I developed in 1993. And in 1998, excuse me, 1988, I purchased the property on County Road. And for the following 22 years, paid the taxes up and until the time that I pledged this property to my church. And, um, and that was in April of 2010. And May of 2010, I received a letter from my parish priest 
<clears throat> indicating that the bishop had accepted the gift and that it was being credited to St. Peter's, which is my parish <clears throat> in Portland, Maine. <clears throat> following week at Sunday Mass, the priest announced the donation at Mass, indicating that it brought St. Peter's Parish to their goal, right? And then the following month of July, that priest was reassigned to Augusta, to St. Michael's in Augusta, Maine. <clears throat> the following June, now I've, and he, he also brought a, that document out to me, in the month of April that I signed. When I signed that document in my office that he brought out, it was my thought that that was it. I was signing this property over to the church. And, and that was, and then like I said, he announced it in mass. He gave me a letter, well, I should say an email, indicating that the bishop had accepted the gift and it was being credited to St. Peter's. That following June, I was in an accident and suffered a spinal injury and I was, immobilized for 15 months. So during that 15 month period, I, you know, I couldn't conduct any business. I was on my back. I couldn't raise my arms above my shoulders to use a telephone to do anything. So, uh, so I was pretty much out of commission. And then, all, then in, in, when I came back to work that following October, which was 15 months after my injury, that December I received a call from Wendy Frazier from the town hall. And she was calling about a, a check she received for the Payne Road property that I own. And in that conversation, she says, Joe, do you own the property at County Road? And at first I was kind of surprised because I own two properties on County Road. One happens to be in Westbrook, and one mile away I own this property in question in Scarborough. So I was just kind of surprised, and so I answered, yes, I do. And she says, do you realize it was foreclosed on? I says, no, I don't. I says, I don't know anything about that. I says, you know what, I'll check it out and get back to you. And so we hung up, and within five minutes, I called Wendy back and said, Wendy, I, you know, I conveyed that property to my church two and a half years ago. I don't, I don't think I own the property anymore. And she said, do you have any documents stating that? I says, yeah, I have all kinds of a dozen email exchanges back and forth between the diocese, the priests, the bowlers company who had the property listed, who I had to get to rescind their contract because I was donating it to the church. So I said, I've got all kinds of documents going back and forth indicating that this was gifted to the church. She said, well, send them to me. You know, I gathered them together as much as I could get. I followed them to her. She said she was going to speak to Tom Hall. She told me, she, then she followed up and said she did speak to him, that she provided him the copies of stuff that I gave her. And then after that, it was a question of communicating with Tom. And between he and I, both our schedules are very challenging. And so, but we did talk three or four times during the next year. We had an appointment, a sit down that following August with him and your town assessor, this guy named Bill Healy. Mm -hmm. And we discussed what happened. And then in, in the meantime, I also got a letter from Elizabeth Badger about renewed interest in the property, which surprised me because at the time I didn't know that this Chris, Chris Riley had left the employee of the diocese. But long story short, this two year period that these taxes went delinquent, you know, the priest that was a lead person on this project was reassigned out of the area. Now, I had an accident and was out of commission for 15 months, and the director at the diocese was out of the employee of the diocese. So I, it just created what seems to be a black hole here. And it, as soon as Wendy informed me of this, I offered to come up that day and pay the taxes. And in every communication I've given to Tom Hall and Wendy, I've made countless offers to pay that as soon as I was aware of it. And she told me she couldn't do anything about it. It was beyond her. She had to speak that I had to speak to Tom, and it was up to Tom and the council to be able to, to, to give me the okay. And that's probably that. a good point to for me to jump in, and, and I'm equally powerless. I mean, this policy doesn't give me the authority to work, given the situation of this property, uh, to work to, to get that property back to Mr. Pio. Uh, I lack the authority to do that. Only the council has the authority to engage in such a, uh, an arrangement. Um, the policy, if you 
took the time to look at it, it does prescribe a process for me to follow, which is to basically solicit input from various department heads and board town committees as to a property's current or potential future value to the public, to the, to the town. Uh, presumably that process is intended to help inform the council is this something you should hold on to. And if not, then there's any number of processes you could consider in terms of uh, selling that property. Um, at the very least, we should be looking to recover, as was as has been promised, uh, you know, all back taxes and costs associated with the, with the transaction. Um, you, you could choose to go beyond that, but at the very least, I'd recommend that that be our standard line and position. Uh, it does occur to me the one thing I could do, and, and I would advise the council you direct me to do, or I will do anyway, is to do that on this property. Um, as part of the background, I, I did have uh, all the appropriate authorities provide input on all the other properties uh, about, about two years ago, but I didn't follow through and provide those as recommendations to council. This property uh, is slightly after that process, so I have not done that. Uh, not solicited that input, but I can do that uh, in fairly short order, uh, just so you're further informed as to the potential value to the town uh, as a productive property for our use. All right. Any questions <coughs> before I get on to? I just just one quick thing. The, yeah. the time frame. So when was the property actually foreclosed on? December 2012. It's the same month that Wendy came. Unfortunately, her call to Joe was after the automatic foreclosure had occurred. Yeah. yeah. And, and what what has happened between 2012 and 2015 as far as conversations and discussions back and forth, oh, for, is it? Oh, for two years I've been going forth with Tom back and forth. And, and part of that was me collecting all the, you know, Joe succinctly provided uh, the litany of a chain of events uh, over the course of that time, Joe's provided me bits and pieces of uh, evidence, but supporting the kind of the calamity of, of factors that bring us tonight. When Wendy called me, she had told me that it had happened 10 days before she was calling me, and and that's the day she called me is the day I offered to come up, even though I didn't believe <coughs> I it was my responsibility to pay the tax and I was going to pay him, because to me that it was a done deal. This was signed over to the church two years before that. Can I ask a question to you? It, yeah. I guess I'm just trying to understand a little bit from my... It, there's no nice way to say this, but if, even if you believe that you didn't, in your own right, need to pay the taxes <coughs> on that property when you received your bill, why did you not communicate to the church? Somebody owed the money. Okay. <laughs> I, I, mean, in my, I mean no disrespect in my that, I've never donated a piece of property but I've sold properties, and in my experience, it just happened to just a month ago. When you sell a property, it seems like the next <coughs> one or two cycles, those bills go to the former owner. So I wasn't surprised when I got a tax bill from Scott, I just chalked it up to the, that, that that's the process, that it'll catch up to the new owner. Just like I just sold a property in Westbrook last December, right? And I just received a tax bill a couple months ago from the town of Westbrook. You know, for the for the taxes. So I don't, so it isn't unusual to receive tax bills after the fact. Can you speak to that a little bit? So so what happens on the town end when when a parcel changes hands like this? It ha had it changed hands? Whether that's in January or that's in March or I mean, yeah, what, what happens with the bill for the tax? Typically, at closing, when a transaction is consummated, there is a proration of taxes. So um, they do it down to the day, typically, and uh, that's how taxes are settled up at the closing table. Um, several months typically pass between uh, a transaction occurring and us being officially notified that it's been transferred. Mm -hmm. So there's often a delay. You know, we will not be made aware until the registry tells us that something's happened, so mm -hmm. the name change doesn't happen. And even after getting the, what's called the transfer tax forms, those go, you know, first to the registry, then to the state, and then they come back. Those get collected in the assessor's office, but they usually do an annual update. 
for the upcoming year as to the transfer. So what Mr. Pio described, often tax bills <coughs> will go to the owner of record that we have of record, and, and it's just sometimes a timing function, but in terms of taxes being paid, those are typically satisfied fully through one party or the other at the closing table. Thank you. I can respond. There's probably no, looking 2020 hindsight, there's probably no good excuse for saying why didn't the parties back then say, wait a minute, something's wrong here. Why is he still getting taxed when he thinks the diocese owns the property? I have to say, I think I would pipe right up if I but, had a couple but, thousand dollars. But bill. remember <laughs> that, that, number one, he thought he had donated it, he was done. Number two, um, when you sell property during a tax year, the town doesn't change its records till the following, following April 1. April 1 is assessment date in Maine. So he made this <coughs> gift in, on April 7th of 2010. Mm -hmm. So as of April 1, previous to that, he owned the property. So he's still going to get the tax bills for the ensuing tax year, which is July 1, 2010 to June 30, 2011. But he got those bills, putting aside the fact that he wasn't well and had more important things to worry about, um, he would have got that bill and said, well, I don't own that property anymore. That should go to the diocese. Now, that didn't happen. Again, looking back, you'd say, well, it should have happened. Well, it just it didn't. So the town filed its first lien in June of 2011. And under Maine law, 18 months from that date, the title automatically forecloses, again, assuming the town follows all the proper steps, mm -hmm. town owns the property. So there's a lien in 2011. Bills were still going out because it hadn't foreclosed. There's a second lien actually in 2012. Then, six months after that second lien is reported, the first lien automatically foreclosed. Two? We had two liens? Well, that's typical because you see, the same <coughs> that happens all the time. So the tax a, my question is, is there a round of paperwork that went out for 2011 and then another round of paperwork? That went out for 2012. What he's referencing are, are two different lien notices based on the same yep. original same lien. Unpaid. We're uh, required under Maine law to provide two different notices for two tax years. All those mail ones, I do You don't have to do a notice of lien for uh, each subsequent year that you do. We you do. Sure. And, I, and I haven't looked at the file, but I'm assuming that happened. All those mailings were returned back to you, they were never delivered. Yeah, that was my they question. They were never what, delivered? Were what, never what, delivered was, what notification of lien? was sent to Mr. Peel? Certified mail. Now, when did he confirm that all the certifieds and all the mail was returned back to him? How come? Well, because one reason is they used the 486 Payne Road address. Oh, my God. And without a post office box, the post office will not deliver mail. All right. Our corporate office was in Westbrook. All right. Just like that notice when we, when, when we met in <coughs> August, they, they had sent me a letter I think a week before I came in to see him, thinking I got it. Well, when they showed it to me in the office, I never received it. So the first question I asked is, where did you send it? They said, 46 pay notice. They, said, they, don't they won't deliver mail there. Right. So you never got so any notice Wendy, of Wendy, lien. Wendy confirmed to me in an email that all the certified and all the letters were returned back to Scarborough. We, we send the lien notices to the, the, the address that we send all the tax yeah. bills. No, I, I do... Like I said, I did receive some communications from the town of Scarborough during this period of time, but I assume they were for our Payne Road property. Right? I never even thought it was for this county road property because I thought this was gone over more than two years before that. Were they notice of lien notification? No, tax bills, uh, you know, notices of taxes due, things of that nature. If they the don't Payne deliver road. it to the 486 address, how did you ever get the tax bills for that property? They went to my personal address in Portland, Maine at the time. Why weren't the notices of lien sent to his personal address if that was the address on record? I don't know. I don't know why he sent the one. He sent the 46 Bain Road. I don't know. I haven't looked at the town's files on any of this because my We've done a review of the process we followed and believe we've complied uh, with the legal requirements of, of notices from lien, and therefore we believe the town owns the property at this point. And we're not. There is a, with the process, just to so you know, the, the notices are supposed to go to the last um, address of record 
in the town's office, and if there's a change on that, the law says the tax collector or the tax party has the responsibility to update the assessor's office. The other thing with these notices, while our courts are, I think, chipping away at the standards uh, a little bit, they are valid if sent. It, it's not the receipt. It's not actual notice. The um, other thing that the courts have indicated year and year, and you can imagine that this case has come up uh, in a number of, of, of circumstances, is that by virtue of owning property in Maine, you're charged with understanding that you're going to be taxed on it. And so if things aren't arriving, there's this sort of, shall we say, indicia of responsibility that something is in, in arrears. In, in looking at these, that the subject taxes were assessed as of, you know, a, the date of valuation was April 1st of 2009, that the ones that were subject to the liens. And there were a couple of years, obviously, after that. And again, for whatever reason, the tax burden wasn't uh, attended to. So I just wanted to make sure that the uh, council understood that in terms of sort of the process on the town's part. One can always look for improvements and try to make these uh, additional embellishments of notice or whatever, but um, we think the standards are probably met here. And, and we're not, I don't want you to get the impression we're arguing about whether the town yeah. did it right or wrong. Uh, uh, we're asking you <coughs> your willingness to make an exception, I guess, in this I, case. I think our stuff. questions are, are driven by the fact that we don't want to set a bad precedent. Right. We don't want to make a bad decision uh, uh, because of the chance that this circumstance will set a precedent and then be the basis on which somebody else would come forward. Right, and, and that's part of the reason I wanted to, Tom asked me to come tonight, and I'm not sure if I drafted this policy as draconian as Rick thinks it might be. <laughs> there was a time period, and, and I think Rick would uh, share with me that when these, there were a lot of foreclosures when I started practicing law in, in Maine 25 years ago, because there was, the credits were failing and everything else, and there was a lot of litigation related to this tax lien process. Just by way of background, I think the legislature put this there to have this foreclosure as a pretty heavy stick because of the concern that people were, in essence, using the municipalities as banks or just going to get away with it one way or another. Then we saw this round of litigation related to cases where one person was allowed to redeem their property, but the next person coming in, maybe they weren't allowed to redeem it. So there was this question of parity and equality and uniformity in the application of the standards. And then we had cases where folks from away weren't allowed to redeem on the summer camp that they didn't pay the taxes on, but, you know, Joe, who'd lived in town 10 years and, or, you know, or whatever, was allowed. So we put these policies in place. Not all communities have them. Some, some communities are just sort of strict by the law. If there's a foreclosure, that's it. We sell the property or we retain it. We don't do anything else. We tried in, in doing these to sort of do a balanced approach where if it was somebody's primary residence, why would you put them out on the street? You create other problems so there's a, a difference between somebody's primary residence and uh, unoccupied vacant land or commercially owned property. And that's why maybe this is overly complicated or whatever, but the kind of concept was that we're not putting people out on the street. We'll work with them to put an installment sales contract together and allow them to live there, and I can tell you in my experience on those is that a lot of those installment sales contracts don't really work over time, but again, it's this difficult situation about collecting taxes and balancing policies uh, around. Um, I think Tom shares with me we probably might at some point in time want to take a look at this policy. It's, uh, it's older. It, it fully couldn't anticipate every circumstance. Mm -hmm. There are those um, circumstances, too, where the amount of taxes is so nominal, the foreclosure takes place, and we have a directive all of a sudden to sell that property. Case in point, we foreclosed just last month on a property for $136. Mm -hmm. right. Good, Good question. question. And I think it's based on Mr. Donovan's book, but have we had any similar cases on the books since that policy has been in place where we've redeemed? Or is there anything similar that the council has acted on? I'm not aware you know, the of question that. around president, have, have we yeah. had anything like this before? I'm sure. not aware of it. We just did it with the land trust. With well, the, with the, um, with, with him property. Well, well, not with him. What's the guy's name? Um, Witten. Witten. Yeah. He did the same thing less than, about three months ago. 
That's the only one I recall. Actually, it was different. But I mean, the point is, the land trust <laughs> came back to the town and requested that the town agree to reconvey the property to the land trust, which was the prior owner, in return for the payment of cost. Yeah, yeah. Circumstances were. Totally different, but I mean, the point is, that I mean, it's a simple. The end result helped help meet some of the town's needs right. as well. Yeah. But it isn't a, it that, be a that's problem. the only other one I'm, I'm aware to of. To your point, we, uh, we still have on our list of tax acquired properties some properties dating back to the 70s, which suggests to me that we've never kind of cleared the backlog. And that's why I mentioned earlier that uh, my predecessors must not have followed this policy either. Uh, and it, frankly, we need to um, comprehensive deal, deal with this. Um, so to solution this. I'm also, the recommendation? I'm also not sure that there's a lot of people come back and ask to do this. That you're, you're probably right, Rick, too, in, in that. Well, the reason that they're being treated, uh, say, treated differently is that they have been persistent to say, you know, we, we, we want our time in front of council. And, and and the, the, the minute, the minute Wendy advised me of this, I tried to make it right. So right. I can tell you, the minute I was informed about it. And so, it, so the solution to this, I mean, the power is within the council, and I think you're wise not to want to make a precedent that someone live with. Um, I would advise the first thing uh, I should do is, is to evaluate the value of this to the town, that we retain the ownership. Um, and the policy very clearly prescribes the process to do so. I can turn that around fairly quickly. That's a piece of information that I think you ought to have. And once you make that decision, whether we retain it, if we decide not to, then we can talk about what method to dispose of the property. The request is to work directly with the prior owner um, to get it back to them. And I think there's a, there's a way to do that, right? Sure. I mean, there's, there's, and, and the other thing I just wanted to make sure to, this is a policy. It's not an ordinance. Your sister community, Old Orchard Beach, has the same process in the charter. I mean, there's no flexibility in the tax acquired property. Uh, policy in Old Orchard because the voters down there said, this, we want to hard and fast, we want this to be blind and, you know, blind and blunt. Um, but this is a policy. It does have a directive in here that, you know, the concept here is to follow the policy. Um, but as we all know, policies are not ordinances and sometimes you can't anticipate every circumstance. So it's the fact that it's a policy, not an ordinance, that gives the council the right to uh, actually make an exception, as opposed to the policy stating that the council can make an exception. Well, that's a, that's a good point, but it's not an ordinance in the, in the fact that, you know, it's on the books as an ordinance, and, and I think the concept when we were putting this together is to always be thinking a little bit forward that, you know, maybe there are circumstances here where you want to make an aberration um, on that, and it's harder to do with an ordinance unless it's, it's clearly stated. The, the other option would be is to, you know, take a look at this before making any action on the request before you and modify your policy to, so that you had clear standards and you could make a distinction. That's the question. We don't have any clear standards. This might be a better uh, rule that policies could take you know, to look at this policy. I don't mean to, to rush everybody, but we are 10 minutes past. Yeah, um, so, Tom, what I would like for you to do, I know um, Jean Marie had talked to me briefly today. She's going to be here with us tonight. She's very interested in hearing kind of some of the dialogue and the questions and, and whatnot. Um, at this point, Tom, I would like to see you pursue, we do have a policy. Therefore, I believe we need to at least follow it, which is exploring it and have all of the options available to us as to what options are available for the property, whether that is to sell it back to them is the best use. But I, I would like them all put together in a package and shared with council. Um, you said you could do the turnaround on that fairly quickly. I could with this particular property. Uh, I'm not, this particular like property. Okay. Yes, certainly. I so, could do it within a couple of weeks. Um, and then perhaps we'll have one other workshop with what the available options are, and then we can take it for a council item. And it may be something, uh, the policy may be something rules and policies will take a look at it and see if it still makes sense. But since it's there, I think we should at least explore it. Can I just make one other one just quickly? Yeah. If we can work something out, it would be better to try to do that before April 1, because then the property will go back on the town's back of the tax rolls. The foundation will start paying taxes. If this doesn't get resolved until after April 1, it'll remain town-owned property and we won't generate any taxes this tax year. So 
point. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point. We yeah, should that, do that's a workable time frame. One ought to be some of the target date to try to. That's good. Try to do this. All right. Um, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Um, just a quick note that um, Tech has asked us to give them about five minutes or so in between so Please. they can we can rearrange. So we'll recess for five minutes and then meet back for regular okay. council meeting. Yes. Tricky. Well, I'm going to recess because it is in the